This is the presentation for policymaking uh, in the healthcare and environmental fields. Now we went over <clears throat> part of this today in class, um, so we'll look at the um, we'll go over the healthcare issues again, and then we'll look at the environmental issues before we head on to the other two presentations that will be uploaded tonight. Now, <clears throat> the healthcare issue is one that's paramount uh, to most Americans for for very different issue for for, di for very different reasons. Um, for the elderly, of course, Medicare uh, is a is a big issue. They want to uh, theoretically live as long as possible and the best health as possible, and they'll pick up part of the tab, but they want the government to pick up the rest of the tab, which means that that tab is picked up by the younger workforce, who is already stretched with a number of of uh, higher taxes to pay for the. Uh, basically for the use of uh, of of things that the elderly uh, need uh, require or want so <clears throat> when we look at today's health care issues um, you know Americans lag behind uh, in some some key health statistics the biggest two especially when you compare uh, the standing in America to that of Europe and to Canada which would be our two closest um, not competitors, but uh, but certainly two two societies that we can reference. Um, we don't live as long, and we lose more infants. That's what mortality means: is we have a higher infant mortality rate. We lose more infants. <clears throat> now, part of that is because too many Americans live a sedentary lifestyle. We don't exercise. We don't eat well. Um, that has, of course, led to things like obesity, diabetes, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the large number of infants which are born to those uh, who are uh, in the lower so lower socioeconomic levels means that um, <clears throat> perhaps prenatal care didn't occur, um, the expected mother still smokes, still drinks, uh, things like that, and that can, of course can affect the health of the fetus. And when the health of the fetus is affected, that leads to a higher infant mortality rate. Um, that's amazing, considering the fact that Americans spend more than any other country when it comes to uh, the health care dollar. So we may not be getting bang for the buck, but there are some reasons for that. Number one, private insurance pays for it. But that may not be as big of a reason as we, as we may think, because in other countries... <clears throat> Uh, the government pays for it because they, they uh, have what's known as single-payer systems. And, and so therefore, in either case, we may not know how much something actually costs. But with private insurance, we really don't know. And for most Americans, they really don't care either. They just want to make sure that it's paid. And so there's no effort to economize. There's no effort to... Um, and and it's, it's not just about effort. There may not be any ability to, to pick and choose the procedures that you want or that you want to pay for. And when cost doesn't seem to be an issue, we Americans want the newest, the most expensive, the most cutting edge technologies that, that exist in order to make our uh, health better. Because we always think that Trump, or that the, the technology trumps um, our environment, uh, how we treat our bodies. So that all those new cutting edge things will take us back to the way we were, and they usually don't. Now that is, of course, you see them all the time, <clears throat> has led to uh, defensive medicine being practiced. You practice not because you think you can cure the person, but you go through a number of things that you can eliminate before you may get to the right uh, prognosis because you're afraid that if you're wrong, um, that you may be sued and you may lose everything. And so we practice defensive medicine. Um, like we were talking today, those who are in the OBGYN um, uh, obstetricians field pay the most because the childbirth can be really, uh, if you if you couple that with the higher infant mortality rate, childbirth can be much more risky for uh, a doctor to to uh, be engaged in. <clears throat> now, what we can say about our healthcare coverage is that it's uneven. And what we can say about care is that it's also uneven. 
um, one eighth of Americans don't have health care insurance. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who is in that one eighth wants health care uh, or wants to be insured. Many young people figure that they don't need uh, need to be covered by insurance, that they're not going to get sick. Um, but obviously, also what they don't take into account is is uh, the, the non sedentary lifestyle, the things that young people do, which are which are cutting edge and, and risk taking, can sometimes lead to the type of energy, in, injuries that require an enormous amount of of uh, healthcare inputs being spent on them. Now, another thing that's unique to the United States is that be, because healthcare or healthcare coverage is provided primarily by the employer, when one loses their job, one usually loses after 30 days or 60 days their health coverage, and then they have to switch over to what's known as uh, COBRA or find um, um, another vendor to give them health care coverage that may not be as good as what they had when they were working directly for the company. So in the end, we can say that health insurance is closely tied to race uh, to income, but primarily its its biggest its biggest tie is to um, the lower so, or the lack of of health insurance is tied to um, a lower socioeconomic uh, level of uh, of accomplishment. Now, as we continue on this this care on this uh, uneven coverage uneven care kick. Um, there's something out there called managed care. We talked a little bit about it today. I asked many of you uh, if you had um, Kaiser as your <clears throat> as your service provider, and many of you do have Kaiser as your service provider. Um, Kaiser is known as an HMO, and HMOs provide about 60% of coverage by Americans. And most likely, HMOs are the major healthcare package that is provided to the middle class and lower classes. Um, HMOs are like Kaiser, HealthNet, uh, Pacific Care in the past, other ones that might be regionally based. Whereas the other 40% are probably covered through uh, insurance companies like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, and, and those where you are uh, perhaps part of a provider network, but you have the ability and the freedom to pick and choose uh, doctors based on the, their specialties and uh, and things like that. With with the HMOs, you have to take the doctor that is in the uh, in the network that is provided by the HMO. <clears throat> now, the one thing that HMOs have done have slowed the rise uh, of the cost of healthcare because, like with Kaiser, which has and does everything under its roof, uh, if you're able to, to do that. Then you have what's known as a managed care system. You, your your mental health, your physical health, all those things are dealt with by the circuit of, of doctors, who uh, have access to your files and and from whatever venue they're looking at you from, they're able to uh, make diagnosis and suggest treat uh, suggest treatments. Now, there's also one thing that has come up uh, in the last thirty years, and that's a patient's bill of rights. Um, at one point, it was felt that the insurers were running roughshod over those who were given um, health care coverage. And the Patient's Bill of Rights gives patients certain rights against medical providers, and that includes the right to sue. Whenever you, whenever you go in for a procedure, you will be signing paperwork, paperwork, which at least requires you to start out with a, medi a mediation process. And if you're unhappy with that, you then still have the right to sue. But most people don't go past that mediation process because it's going to cost you some money. Now, the role of government in healthcare is interesting. The United States, as far as government goes, has the smallest presence in healthcare. With Medicare and with Medicaid, we do make some judgment as to what will be treated and what will not be treated. Uh, but it's less intrusive than it is in other countries. Now, Obamacare may change that if it stays in effect. My personal opinion, of course, is the, the better and faster we get rid of it and let the market take over, the better off we'll be. Now, the government is really involved in two big, two big programs. One is Medicare and one is Medicaid. Medicare, of course, is for the elderly. Medicaid is for the poor. And Medicaid is usually paid through by um, block grants to the state governments. And that is where you're seeing 
a lot of resistance to Obamacare, of course, is from the states, because Obamacare requires the states to pick up a great deal of the of the cost, and the states are unwilling to. They're in bad financial shape, and now you want to put this on their plate too. <clears throat> now you can see here from this uh, from this figure, this pie here, that um, the big the two biggest cuts are. Uh, private insurance, and then Medicare and Medicaid, which uh, is approximately 67% of the uh, of where the health care dollar goes to those three programs. Others uh, are other government programs, the VA, for instance, um, out-of-pocket expenses, that's people paying paying uh, for health care with cash, and then other private resources are also uh, looked at. So that's pretty much how things look for the last decade. Now, with healthcare policy, um, we have opted, I think as a society, to think that at least medical technology can be omnipotent. And so we put in the backseat the equality of care and cost containment for um, the use of the newest and the latest and the greatest uh, cutting edge uh, medicine because sometimes on rare occasions, what we have requires something new to to be to be tried out. But um, when you're trying cutting edge things, it's really really expensive. And so we have to ask ourselves by using a cost benefit ratio, by putting the equality of care and cost containment in the back seat, are we actually costing us a lot more money? And I think we have to say that we are. That's exacerbated by the fact that interest groups, from medical professionals to insurance companies to hospitals to whatever, play a major role in, in uh, healthcare policy making. And very rarely are they in agreement. Already, these, the somewhat spotty unified movement between AARP and the insurance companies and all uh, over Obamacare is beginning to split apart as we see many doctors go, this isn't going to work. And that's that's certainly their choice. In a capitalist society, you can you can do something different. And of course, like I said, doctors are deciding in many cases to do something different. Now, we're not really going to talk about Obamacare because it's too recent to, for things to be uh, on the test. We have to recognize that it is out there and what it does. But uh, normally, um, we stick with looking at the Clinton health care reform plan of 1993, which was defeated by a concerted effort of various interest groups who didn't like the fact that it was, that it, it essentially was a single payer plan. It, it involved the, the bureaucracy way too much, and it was just extremely complicated, much like what we have being implemented now. Uh, I don't think it was 2,700 pages long, but it was too much. And um, eventually, uh, due to the opposition of many of these groups, it died in Congress. But it is at least one of the signature efforts of Hillary Clinton uh, in this 1993-1994 period, um, which gained her uh, a very, um, I think, solid uh, group of supporters uh, who have liked her and always found her to be competent. Now... Um, polls show and continue to show to this day that most Americans are very satisfied with their insurance and with their health care uh, coverage and with their relationship with their doctors and things like that. But they realize that some reform is needed. They just don't want it to be as radical as Obamacare will be. The main concerns for most people are access. They don't want to have to use an emergency room and cost. Are they going to lose everything if something that happens to them requires extensive medical treatment? So with all of this, and even with Obamacare coming into, uh, into, into, um, into operation, um, it's confusing, it's expensive, it's complex, and you've got all these different providers and the government and all of that, and people, I think, are, are waiting, holding back to see what's going to happen. I don't think they're going to be happy. Now, when it comes to environmental policy, we talked a little bit about um, Palmdale Hospital today having to file a number of environmental impact reports so that they could ascertain what kind of effect having a hospital 
in an area that, uh, at least on three sides, is surrounded by homes, how it would affect the neighborhood? How would they mitigate, or how would the hospital mitigate its presence when it came to noise pollution, uh, air pollution, in traffic, any number of those things. Um, and so it had to file a number of envi environmental impact reports, and ultimately those passed the county or in the city of Palmdale, and they were allowed to build a hospital. Now when groups, affected groups, feel that they're not being listened to, they can go to court and they can challenge a project and they can delay that project. Uh, by having or asking the court to uh, issue an injunction. But ultimately, either something has to change or that injunction um, will be removed and the project will proceed. And again, you also have to have standing. You just can't uh, arbitrarily uh, file something because you don't like a project that's, that is being done you know, 200 miles away. It has no effect on you. Now, the first of the big pieces of legislation passed by a box a bipartisan Congress was the Clean Air Act of 1970. Its role was to reduce auto pollution. And it's done a, a decent job. Hey, do we look like China? Have you seen the pictures of Shanghai or Beijing on a bad day? Our cities don't look like that, at least not anymore. Because we have, we have not t tamed air pollution, but we certainly have reduced it. And that's been a combination of both rules set by the federal government and by the state governments. And in some cases, like in California, the rules set by the state government are actually tougher than the rules put forth by the federal government. Now, in 1990, their amendments were um, added to the, Clear, uh, the Clean Air Act of 1970 to allow um, big polluters to trade um, emissions credits with those who had really cleaned up their act so that they, they, they could gain more time in order to make uh, the kind of changes that they, they needed in their their plants or whatever in order to become cleaner. But it's one way that the market was kind of working with, uh, with the environment. Now clean water comes along a couple years later. The Water Pollution Control Act of 1972 was intended to clean up the nation's rivers and streams and lakes um, and requiring that anybody who is dumping refuge into the water the waterways had to use pollution control technologies in order to begin the process of cleaning up those rivers. And this is, of course, after the Cleveland River, which flows through downtown Cleveland, caught on fire in the late 1960s because it was so polluted with chemicals and other things. And since 1972, the Clean Water Act, which it's kind of known by, has done, a, I think, a marvelous job in cleaning up lakes and streams and and rivers here in the United States, uh, and they are cleaner, and they are safer to drink the water from, and they are safer to eat the eat the uh, the, the fish and, and other things from. What has been a real struggle, though, is trying to figure out how to deal with the runoff pollution, which is uh, the the type of pollution that occurs when the weather is wet. Uh, the runoff from sidewalks and especially streets, with its mixture of of dropped gasoline and dripped oil um, gets wet. It uh, doesn't dissolve, but it certainly becomes is put in a liquid form, and then winds up as it as it flows into the sewers. And then in the like in L.A. the uh, L.A. Uh, uh, flood control system, it winds up in the ocean, and therefore places like Santa Monica Bay in Los Angeles Harbor can be um, very very polluted after a storm because we haven't figured out how yet to deal with a runoff pollution. Now we've also brought many uh, many elements of the ecosystem of the animal ecosystem back from the uh, from the edge of extinction. Uh, animals like the California condor and, and others um, have uh, have shown that wilderness preservation policies have worked. We're a world leader in wilderness preservation, our national parks and national forests um, are in fairly good shape, uh, at least from a management standpoint. They're not in good shape when it comes to um, the environment because of drought, the uh, the bark beetle, and 
and other things. But we actually have more trees planted in the United States. We have more forest coverage now than we did uh, when the uh, colonists arrived three centuries ago, or actually four centuries ago in 1609, 1607, 1609. Now, one thing that we've really dealt with is what's called endangered species. The government protects these species, or those species, which are listed as endangered. And we do this regardless of the cost. So we've spent millions of dollars in saving the, uh, the California condor, the American eagle. Um, we've spent millions of dollars bringing those, those back, the, the peregrine falcon. And, and, and it's probably been worth it. And we've done this through what's known as the Endangered Species Act. Now, there can be a some exceptions made, but for the most part, the act is the act takes precedence over most other things, and the fact that the act is in place can stop a project in its tracks when it, there's a, a realization that something on the property, like the darter snail, um, which may be only a few hundred in number, and maybe in a, you know their their home area might just might be a small area. Uh, but if we bulldoze that area, they're going to lose their home and they will become, become extinct. These kind of things do happen. They've happened in California. They've happened in most other places. And so um, the, biggest, the biggest and probably most noticeable thing, other than the Endangered Species Act, has been how America deals with what we call toxic wastes. Congress created the Superfund in 1980 to clean up hazardous waste sites. Now this was um, this was on the heels of uh, the Love Canal uh, crisis in Buffalo, New York, where a um, a subdivision had been built on top of a chemical dump, and very rare cancers and things were killing uh, men, women, and children. Um, this the site was so haz hazardous they had they bought everybody out. They had to literally bull bulldoze the site scrape the topsoil, the contaminated uh, topsoil, treat it, and then begin to rehabilitate it from scratch. Now what it's done is it has virtually eliminated uh, most of the haphazard dumping of toxic waste, and that includes toxic waste that was being disposed of by the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, place, things like that. But it's been much more difficult in cleaning up existing waste, including things like plastic bottles, tires, and things that should go in dumps, but they last uh, hundreds of years. The biggest, the biggest frustration, so what do we do with our nuclear waste? And we're not talking about uh, fission from bombs, but we're talking primarily things like spent rods that, uh, that um, are removed from nuclear power plants uh, after their, after their, um, after their, uh, their length of, t of operation has been, uh, has been used up. And um, we want to put um, our spent rods deep in the ground under, uh, in some mines in, in eastern Nevada. There's no faults. There's no earthquake faults. Um, it's probably the safest place on the, uh, on the uh, continental United States to do this. But the state of Nevada has, uh, has said, we don't want it here. And we've they've uh, fought uh, the federal government to a draw on this issue. Now we can see that with energy policy, we get very little. <clears throat> we get very little uh, of our energy from nuclear, but we get it from three other fossil fuels: oil, natural gas, and coal. And actually, oil is up. Uh, natural gas is way up. The United States has been found to be a um, a big producer of natural gas. Coal. Which, which is a problematic uh, fossil fuel, uh, has gone down in the amount being used as, as coal plants have been, have been uh, um, put to bed and new coal plants are not allowed to be built. Uh, so that has affected the, uh, uh, the uh, economies of several states, including Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Now, we know that 87% um, that of the nation's energy comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, it's very difficult to increase that. It requires a major investment in uh, in alternative uh, considerations, windmills, solar panels, and things like that. 
um, we have at least four centuries of coal uh, in the United States. We probably have the biggest coal reserves in the world, but nobody's really been able to figure out how to burn coal, not only efficiently, efficiently but also very cleanly. Oil, of course, has created a dependence uh, by the United States on uh, that oil. The United States does produce, I believe, about half of its uh, fossil fuel needs, but has to import the other half from places like Venezuela, uh, Nigeria, and um, our good um, our good uh, allies in Saudi Arabia, and Dubai, and Abu Dhabi, and Qatar. And we can see that um, based on uh, uh, 2002, so this is 11 years old, we can see that um, that the United States has very small reserves. OPEC has the bulk of them, and it's primarily Saudi Arabia, Iran, and especially Iraq, surprisingly so. And we can see that um, the millions of barrels consumed each day uh, slowly eats away at the proven reserves of, uh, of all these countries. And of course, now the biggest one, uh, the biggest monster in the room, which rivals the United States has been the arrival of China and the amount of oil it needs to feed its uh, its industrial economy. And of course, the other thing I've been dealing with, starting with the Bush administration and then gathering some some steam um, before that with the Clinton administration and then again with the uh, Obama administration, is what to do about global warming. Um, Scientists, there are scientists on both sides of the issue. Uh, something is obviously happening, but how much of it is global warming? How much of it is the the natural heating up and cooling down of the planet at, at any time? Because we've had these things happen before, without the presence of industrialization. Um, how much is how much of it is is a natural cycle? We don't know, but we do know that we probably have to produce greenhouse gases. And we have to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the cost to do this has to be charged immediately. But unfortunately, the effects will not be felt until decades later. And so you, you continue following those policies and hurt your economy, as China is refusing to do. They don't want to hurt their economy. Or, you know, what do you do? You can't force nations to do something that they don't want to do no matter how many meetings you have. Now, the issue uh, of the environment is, is political because it puts the public, many different publics, um, against each other because the environment is a public good and it does get measured and it does get beat up by private concerns. So there are more groups. There's more people getting involved. Um, none of them... There's no uniform environmental policy. It changes from administration to administration. By telling people what they can do with their land that they own and not allowing them to do certain things with their land that they own is kind of anathema to, um, to the rights guaranteed you in the Constitution. And many of the policies, for instance, President Obama's alternative fuels policy, they're, they're controversial and expensive, and they don't yield much in the way of, uh, of, um, of progress. Now, if we look at um, health care and, and, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I cut that off. If we look at, uh, at health care and in, healthcare policy and environmental policy, the issues on both sides, both health care and, and environment, um, are issues that involve all levels of government. The high-tech issues limit citizens' participation because we're, our heads are whipping around one way or the other as, as, as the, the bigger players talk about the use and the cost of technologies. Um, both issues rely, on, uh, rely heavily on group participation, and that's why what happens in 2014 with Obamacare will be very, very interesting. And really only the groups are the ones that can afford the research into science and policy issues Individuals rarely do, uh, rarely do that or can afford to do that. Um, the scope of government programs when it comes to healthcare and environmental policy um, 
kind of laid out like this. If we want more health care reform, the size of government will increase. Hence, that's one thing that's going to happen with Obamacare. Why do we need that, though? Let the consumer decide. Increased environmental protection will cause the size of government to go up, too. With party divisions, incremental change is probably the most likely uh, route of action. You're not going to see anything that's breathtaking or, or, uh, or, or astonishing happen with, uh, with either issue. 